Hello everyone, I'll be talking today about open source license compliance in this new era of AI assisted coding. Along the presentation, you will see some graphics that were automatically generated using Dream Studio. You can see the prompts in the bottom. I'll start by saying that AI's ban, just like witchcraft in the Middle Ages, it's just fueled by fear. But this fear for the unknown, or more specifically for things that challenge existing business models, is nothing new. In fact, we've seen this in the past. If you're old enough for having experienced this for yourselves, you'll remember what happened with open source. Open source developed along the years, and there was a point of disruption. I'd say that that was towards the end of the 90s, when we had massive availability of a number of Linux distributions. This, of course, immediately challenged the existing closed source business models. You remember the lobbying, you remember the pu public and private policies. You remember that Microsoft called open source the cancer of software, though later they bought GitHub because companies soon realized that those not embracing open source were not as efficient. Companies embracing open source already had building blocks. They could build faster. So corporations started adopting open source. They set up processes and tools to enforce those processes. They launched products and open source technologies evolved into standardization. Governments demanding software bill of materials. We've got SPDX and Cyclone DX. We have standard identifiers like package URL, and we have the ISO 5230. And I believe the same is happening today with AI. The growth of AI was exponential, just like open source. It just took longer to develop, but towards the end, we see a, a very rapid ramp up. Disruption in AI was clearly the launch of ChatGPT to the public. In the first few weeks of 2023, we saw, we saw hundreds of companies launching products on top of ChatGPT. But the immediate reaction was banning. Again, we don't know what's happening. With AI-assisted development, the integration of third-party code becomes involuntary. And that is scary because we still must fulfill license conditions of every open source we have. And it doesn't matter if it was a neighbor, if it was ourselves, or if it was an AI assisted tool who brought it in. It is our company's liability when that product hits the streets. So we see immediate banning public and private policies, banks, financial institutions telling employees not to use AI, but it becomes obvious that if you do not use AI, you have quite a disadvantage because development is drastically accelerated by using AI assistance. So what comes next is that there, there will be corporate adoption, there will be policies and there will be standardization. But the point is that that initial banning it's a natural reaction, and we've already seen that in the past. The software development landscape today, we know that about 90% of software is open source. So this is a big deal. Governments are demanding software bill of materials, and the proliferation of AI-assisted coding is just quickly ramping up. There's a high number of tools available to make developers' lives easier, but again, third-party software integration becomes involuntary, and that is a problem. And developers who don't use AI are being eclipsed by those who do. Perhaps one of the biggest challenges of applying copyright law to software is that we have adapted copyright laws made for human expression. When we write software, we have a limited set of instructions. The language is precise, unambiguous, and deterministic. So we have a higher chance of generating existing content in source code compared to human texts, for example. However, 
we are still enforcing software licenses with laws made for human expression. Another challenge is that computers learn from existing copyrighted code just like humans. Every painter, musician or writer was inspired by an earlier painter, musician or writer. If you write C code, I'm sure you've read Dennis Rich's book. So you've read Dennis Rich's code and you are writing C code based on your learnings and in inspiration from Rich's code. Does that mean that the code you write belongs to Richie? No, of course not. The man deserves a lot of credit for everything he's done. But if you use his code for learning and as in inspiration to make something that is different, then the code is entirely ours. Now, if we copy and paste codes from Rich's book into something else, then of course, that's a different case. But the code that we generate that is not a carbon copy of what he wrote belongs to us and nobody else. So does that mean that courts will relax towards AI generated code? Well, I believe the answer is plain and simple, no. Because as judges remain human, copyright law and all existing jurisprudence will hold sway. But the problem is not just about license compliance. If your software composition is unclear, then you're assuming a number of other risks because you can't comply with or protect what you cannot see. So in addition to license compliance, you could be assuming trade compliance risks. If you don't know which open source you're using, then you won't know for a fact a complete list of the cryptographic algorithms that you're using. And that means you're assuming a risk when it comes to trade compliance. You also might be exposed to security vulnerabilities if you don't know which open source you're using, if you don't know your software composition. Same goes with the quality of the code you're using and the health of the components. Is the component you're using obsolete? Is the code you're using obsolete? Also, not knowing your cryptographic algorithms exposes you to quantum unsafe encryption. Companies now begin to worry about the quantum safety of their products based on the cryptographic algorithms they're using. And since 90% of our code is open source, guess where the cryptographic algorithms will be coming from? In fact, when it comes to encryption, rule number one is do not make your own encryption, which means that maybe 100% or close to 100% of our encryption comes from the open source we use. And there, and there will be other risks that we still don't know, like the quantum safe encryption was not a concern a few years ago. So the bottom line is that a complete and accurate view of your software composition is the first step towards any sort of risk mitigation. So where is the problem? Where, where, where is the boundary be between what's okay and what is not okay? Well, AI doesn't bring anything new. I mean, this is the same problem as copying and pasting from Stack Overflow or from GitHub. You always have a gray zone in between being inspired by someone else's work and just a verbatim copy. So you know that copying and pasting is wrong. You know that being inspired by someone else's work is okay, but there is a whole gray zone in between. For example, if you take someone else's work and you just uh, replace the variable names, you're still in a very dark zo zone. It's not a verbatim copy anymore, but it's clearly a copy of someone else's work. So you're still in a very, very dark uh, area. And being inspired and using someone else's methods to solve a problem is a lighter gray zone, I would say. But again, you also have patents, which is another element here. 
let's leave that as aside for a minute. Being inspired by someone else's work and solve a problem the same way or a similar way in, in general terms doesn't mean copyright infringement. But you will say, okay, but when it comes to ChatGPT, it's not really copying and pasting. ChatGPT knows how to code, right? So in that case, ChatGPT will always be on the brighter side. And actually, that is not really the case. It's quite common that ChatGPT and other tools will bring a verbatim copy of someone else's work. Here, here is an example of one of our engineers asking ChatGPT to write winnowing, the winnowing algorithm in C. That's an open source algorithm we use for creating source code fingerprints. There are a number of implementations in GitHub. It took 11 regenerations. You can see the, the, the count on the left. But after clicking on regenerate 10 times, we got to this, which is very interesting because ChatGPT brought in our implementation of winnowing from GitHub. And this is a carbon copy of our code. It uses the same gram and window size that we use, we use in, in our code, same function names and same exact code. But what really blew our minds is the fact that if you can see in this add hash function, you can see on the left side, the generated code by ChatGPT I mean, it's even explaining below what it does. On the right side, you see our code from GitHub. And if, if any attorney is looking at this, would agree with me that when you see that three line comment, that's a human text from one of our engineers that says hashing the hash will result in a better balanced resulting data set, blah, blah, blah. ChatGPT brought a carbon copy of that comment. So a, a human comment on code is a footprint. That is evidence that makes it crystal clear that this was copied from our GitHub code. So if someone takes the code generated by ChatGPT and puts that into someone else's code, then that company or that developer will not be fulfilling the requirements of the license under which we made this code available. So, so this is a really good example on how ChatGPT does copy and paste. On the top right section, you see, you see the results from our scanning engine when, when it scans the code generated by ChatGPT. And in fact, it points to the actual, um, it points to the actual repo with all the license information and so on. So yes, using ChatGPT means that you're assuming a risk if you don't validate your output. Again, identifying undeclared components is a key to a complete SBOM. Undeclared components are anything that you do not really declare and things that you will not be able to catch with any tool that generates an SBOM based on the known dependencies file taken from GitHub that doesn't have a license header, maybe an entire component if you're talking about C or C++, maybe a snippet taken from Stack Overflow, or a snippet generated by an AI assistant. None of that will be detected by any, by any tool looking at declare components. So you need to check for plagiarism. And the only way to do that is to check against a known open source database. ScanOSS is an automated license compliance validation tool. Our tool is built to be integrated with CI CD pipelines and is entirely open source. Our database of known open source is the largest in the industry and is available entirely for free through the Software Transparency Foundation in osskb.org. By being open source, ScanOSS puts an end to the secret hashing algorithms and the way that the data is being handled. Everything you use is open source so you know what's going on. And of course, it puts an end to vendor locking mechanisms. This is a problem that's been affecting the 
the industry for many, many years. And since our focus is the data, we have the best and fastest database in the market. We want the data that we provide you to be useful, to be as useful as possible for you. So we provide you not just with the complete software bill of materials, that is the sum of your declare and undeclare components, but also we give you precise identifiers. If the software bill of materials is complete and has precise identifiers, then it becomes actionable. We want that data to be useful for you and we want you to be able to aggregate data with other systems. And ultimately, since we are open source and free for everyone, we solve this inbound S-Bond problem. Companies start to demand from their suppliers that they run ScanOSS to provide them with the software pillow of materials. That means that large companies no longer have to assume the cost of auditing everything they get from their suppliers. This brings transparency to the supply chain. Since we're open source, an ecosystem quickly gather around our tool. Other open source SEA tools and even commercial SEA tools integrate with ScanOSS natively. Fosology is an open source component that I'm sure you all know, which is maintained mainly by Siemens today. From version 4.3.0, it includes the ScanOSS agent natively. Same applies to Foslite, developed by LG in South Korea, and ORT, or OSS Review Toolkit, developed by Bosch IO and Here Technologies. These three tools give you a view of your software composition by looking at the declared components. However, with the, with the ScanOSS integration, now they have visibility on the undeclare. For example, Fosology can now detect the license of a file that does not have a license header. This is a big step forward and allows and gives Fosology a plagiarism check capability that was not there before. Commercial SEA tools like TrustSource in Germany also integrate with ScanOSS. Auditing firms are consuming our data as well, and we've even been tested in European courts. The first GPL case in Italy at the end of 2021 used ScanOSS to gather the evidence to defend the GPL license in the country. Since we are a data company, we are built for integration. We are an API. And that API is built on open standards, REST and gRPC, open API and protobuf. We have SDKs ready in a number of languages and we have CLIs built on those SDKs. We also have pipeline integration solutions and webhooks and IDEs and IDE integrations and even our own user interface. Of course, we use open data standards. We support SPDX in a number of versions and Cyclone DX. And we even produce JSON, HTML, and CSV reports for file level information. And we use package URL and CPE as software identifiers. And we're soon adding the software heritage ID. So our software composition analysis solution provides an accurate standardized detection of code plagiarism. It's adopted by a number of open source communities and SEA suppliers and validated in European courts. As an open source company, we, we sponsor the biggest open source projects. We are a sponsor of the Linux Foundation and the Eclipse Foundation and the Software Heritage. We are members of the Software Defined Vehicle Group and we speak at as many events as we can handle. Now we're gonna zoom in quickly into how is this comparison done? How do we know if there is open source in your code? On the top left, you see a piece of code. On the bottom left, you see the fingerprints. Since we are an open source company, we're the first company that allows you to know and see how are those fingerprints being calculated. So there, there are no secrets there. And the, uh, the, and the fingerprints are cryptographic hashes and checksums. So you know that cryptographic hashes and checksums cannot be reversed back to the original code. This is pure math and it's open algorithms. Once we calculated those fingerprints, those fingerprints are what we are sending to the API. And this is a real example. So just by sending those few numbers, we get the big result 
JSON array you see on the right side, which says there is a snippet on lines 1 to 10 that corresponds to lines 165 to 174 in that particular open source component. And we provide you with a list of package URLs as precise identifiers and number of hashes. We also decorate the license with Osado. We also cooperate with Osado in Germany, where we periodically mine the data that they publish. They make these data sets with metadata from the interpretation, the legal interpretation of open source licenses. This is very useful. So you can see if what's being detected is incompatible with uh, which licenses and if it is copyleft or not. And this is not us making the statements. This is a team of professionals in Germany making this legal statement on these licenses. So this is very useful too. So the bottom line of this slide is that when you analyze your code and compare it with the knowledge base, you're not exposing your code. Cryptographic hashes are calculated and are sent to the API, which means that your code never leaves your computer. If you want to scan code in your computer, all you have to do is install any of the CLIs we have because they are present in the public repo. So you can just pip3 install scanOSS and then scan OSS by scan a directory and you get your results in your standard output. The same goes for our JavaScript CLI. And this is very useful for making integrations to web pages or IDE plugins and so on. You, again, you don't need a username, a password. You don't need to register. Thanks to the OSSKB.org, you can just download and scan anonymously and securely. All the source code is available in GitHub. And since we are an API and there, there's no backend dependencies on, on the client side, we build the first auditing app. The Audit Workbench, now renamed Esbon Workbench, is an app that you can download pre-built for any Windows, Mac OS, or Linux computer. You double click on it, create a new project, point to a directory, and it starts scanning right away and gives you all the results in your screen in a graphical way. Then you can then you can browse your file tree and just make your identifications like, like any other SCA tool in the market. The difference is that this is entirely open source and entirely free and anonymous for everyone. The source code is available in GitHub and is open source just like everything we do. And as I mentioned before, our UI or CLIs, everything points by default to osskb.org, which is the API provided by the Software Transparency Foundation. And that is entirely free and anonymous for everyone. Now, when a company needs to connect their mission critical systems with an API, will require guaranteed availability, guaranteed throughput, an SLA with the re response time and, and escalation procedures. And that is how ScanOSS makes money by selling dedicated guaranteed instances of the API and knowledge base, which could work in SaaS or on-premise. So I made it to the end of uh, the presentation and the bottom line here is that we believe that we should embrace AI assisted development and that we should validate the output with tools like ScanOSS, which is open source and free for everyone. Knowing your software composition is foundational to all angles of open source risk. Thank you all very much for your attention.